No. Should have had the one. This one. All right. So, uh, welcome to lecture four. Okay. Uh, which is, uh, I made a few changes before we start uh, with the lecture. I made a few changes to the lesson plan. Uh, so Prolog is going to be an important language for us because we're going to use it for several other, uh, we're going to use it as a programming language, the way we use C, not just to talk about it. So initially I thought that it would be okay to introduce this language. Guys, there's a lecture going on. If you come in late, at least be quiet, right? So uh, we're going to use it as a programming language in quite a few uh, little projects. So uh, syntactic analysis, and we're going to talk about semantics, and we're going to build a small interpreter for a procedural language. So initially I thought that I could, I could introduce this language in little parts as I would talk about different aspects of programming languages, but then re-looking at the entire, at, at how everything blends in, I uh, realized that it's not quite the best approach and I would prefer actually to introduce the language in one full lecture so we can use it later. So you get a bit of time to practice with uh, the concepts uh, that are specific to Prolog. So uh, take a look at the new lesson plan. Uh, the lecture that was supposed to be on rule-based programming, which is in fact the concept underlying the language Prolog, has been removed and we're doing this lecture right now, and everything has been shifted by one um, week. Uh, pretty much the content is going to be the same, so it's just a reordering, more or less. Uh, this is a completely new programming paradigm, uh, new to most of you. Um, you will probably require a bit of practice to get used to the concepts um, and to become, uh, you know, uh, reasonably efficient prolog programmers. We're going to have as many examples. Um, as we can. And again, remember, every programming language is a tool which has to be used for the right purpose. So the purpose for this tool is program manipulation. We want to do stuff about other programs, and especially imperative programs, because your main skill will be, you will be programming in an imperative paradigm most of the time, but we want to understand stuff about that, and Prolog is going to be useful along the way. So uh, this is what we're going to be talking about, and, and some of you are taking the compiler class, 4212, and if you're wondering, yes, it's the same lecture. Um, no point in, well, there's slight adaptations here and there, but it's essentially the same uh, lecture as lecture 2 of 4212. Um, so we want to start with a few basic concepts. We're going to see a completely new type of data. This type of data will be common to several other languages, namely OCaml, Haskell, um, right? It's symbolic data and sort of has the uh, same role as symbolic constants in C, right? In C, we can define a symbolic constant. We can use a macro, right, to replace a number by a name. So this is a pretty much, in, in general, we don't really care what the value of that number is, right? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But many, many times we don't really uh, need to know. We just need to know that all the symbolic constants are different. We can say symbolic constant x1 is different from symbolic constant x2, so we can differentiate between them. So Prolog comes with this concept of atom. An atom is a identifier, if you want, right? Uh, if I, it identifies a piece of data that you give, you have a meaning for, right? And uh, the essential aspect is that all atoms are distinct. Uh, syntactically, they start with small letters, and they have pretty much the syntax of C variables, C identifiers. But they start with small letters. Capitalized names are variables in Prolog. So this is an essential distinction. We don't have type declarations. Prolog is dynamically typed. And the only way we can distinguish between uh, um, atoms and variables is by the first letter. Now, there are instances when we actually want atoms to start with a capital letter or where they don't 
uh, follow exactly the syntax of the identifier. In that case, we can enclose them in simple quotes. And they are still atoms. So ABC space DF is also an atom. Capital X in, uh, in, in quotes is a uh, atom. Now, one interesting thing is any sequence, without, without using uh, um, uh, quotes, any sequence of special characters, like plus, 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 minus, plus, plus, star, plus, anything you can come up with, is also an atom. And this is going to be important later. And uh, I can take even an expression and make it into an atom if I enclose it in a um, single quote. Uh, integers are the normal integers, floating point numbers are what you would expect, the same as in C. I was saying variables are capitalized. There's, um, variables are different from variables in C in the sense that they look like mathematical variables. They are single assignments. Once they have taken a value, that value cannot be changed. And that's similar to functional programming as well. Most functional program, uh, pro, uh, programs in most functional programming languages, scheme included, right? it's not customary to change the uh, value of a variable. It comes in as an argument to a function, and it keeps the same value for the entire duration of the execution of that function. Right? Of course, scheme has the set bank feature that simulates assignment, but that is not a mainstream feature, you could say. Now, one important aspect, which is even more important in Prolog, is the ability to aggregate data. And uh, in C, you may remember that we have structures. In Java, we have objects. Uh, in Scheme, we have lists, right, as means of aggregating uh, data. In Prolog, we have terms, which are constructs of this form, right? They resemble the syntax of a mathematical function, but it's just the syntax. There will be no call made. So we have a functor name, and then we have an argument, which can be another term, and another argument, which can be another term. So as arguments, uh, as, as terms, they would have their own arguments. One, two, right? At the lowest level, we need to have atoms or uh, con uh, numeric constants or variables, right? This is what will be at the um, base, at, at the leaf level of this term. The functor name has to be an atom, cannot be a variable, cannot be an integer. And this is similar to a structure in C. It's a way of aggregating data. These terms can get very large. You're seeing this small expression, right? You can easily have a term representing a tree, for instance, they're representing a binary search tree, for instance, that has one million nodes, that has one million, a, a depth of one, maybe a depth is too much, maybe a depth of 10,000, right? And uh, uh, possible uh, number of elements that is, uh, you know, close to two to the power of that. Or a depth, that's 10,000 is way too much, right? Maybe a depth of 30, right? And maybe 2 to the 30 um, notes. So uh, this is always a little reminder that I'm uh, placing on the slides just in case you're reading the slides uh, by yourselves without listening to the recording, right? So these are atoms. Uh, numeric constants are as usual. Variables are capitalized. And we have terms, right? So just syntactically, they simulate the syntax of mathematical uh, or function of mathematical function notation, but that's where the analogy stops. Um, remember, they can get very large, and we always have a tree-based reading of terms, which is very straightforward, right? So whatever is the outer functor, right? sits at the root of the tree, and we go down hierarchically up to the leaves. And inside the tree, we have many subtrees, which we call subterms. All right? 
And we'll see very soon that if we take an imperative language, a language that has while loops and assignments, we can very easily represent it as a tree as well. And from, and we actually will model that program as a prolog term, and we're going to use a prolog program to interpret the, the, imperative, the imperative program, the imperative toy language that we devise. Um, what do we do? What kind of, what do we execute in prolog? So this is data. This is the kind of data that we work with. What do we execute in prolog? Well, prolog executes queries, and it has a read, eval, print loop as you are used to in C. We type in a query, we get an answer, we type in another query, we get another answer, and so on and so forth. And these queries can be against a program that has been loaded previously. Right, so uh, typically we open a text editor, we write a program, we feed the program into the interpreter, the program sits there in the background, and then we execute queries against the program. Uh, the query succeeds or fails. So this is the important concept. And when it succeeds, it may provide answers for some, pro uh, uh, for some variables that we put in the query. So we'll see that shortly. We're going to start with the simplest type of query, which is the unification request. Its equality of two terms is an equation, a very simple type of equation. So... Uh, Right, the simplest thing you could type is A equals A, and that will succeed, right? It's not very surprising. Um, so this is success. The interpreter will reply with, depending on the interpreter that you use, either success or true or, uh, or yes. Yes is also very common. So they, it, it can be yes, no, true, false, right, or success, failure. If we say A equals B, they're different, right? They're both atoms, they're different. The answer will be no. These are not very interesting, right? They're interesting as you learn, but if you're a seasoned prolog programmer, this is not a very interesting kind of query. If we have two identical terms, again, we have success. If the terms differ just a little bit, we have failure. Right, and the difference can appear in many places. It may appear in one argument, or it may appear even in the functor name. So if we have something whose functor is f, that cannot be equal to something whose functor is g. And also, they, failure would happen if the two terms have different number of arguments. And the number of arguments is called arity. You might know that already. Right, so if we have two terms, the same functor, functor but different arity, then we have failure. And the same concept, uh, um, the, the, the same explanation holds for the last query, okay, where we have failure as well. And here we uh, should emphasize that, in fact, an atom is a functor of arity zero, a functor that doesn't take any arguments. Right, so when we see f, it is as f being applied to nothing. All right, and um, this is the main computational mechanism. So we have to understand unification very well. Uh, uh, unification very well. So this is a unification request. We haven't seen any variables yet. Uh, all right, but the ability to match two different terms, this is the main computational mechanism in Prolog, and we'll see how far it can take us. Um, so, um, so let's see, let's see uh, a few unification requests with, with variables. So now, things get a bit more complicated. Uh, so let's say we have this unification request, fxb equals fay. So the interpreter, the interpreter will say, can I find values for x and y so that the two terms become identical? Can I replace x with something and y with something so that I have success? And the answer here is yes, and it's relatively easy to see that uh, this is true. If x becomes a and y becomes b, then the two terms are identical, so this leads to success. The interpreter will reply with true and return bindings. 
right? These are called bindings for variables x and y. Variable x and y initially do not have values, do not have bindings, and in the process of unification become bound. Once they are bound, they stay bound to these values forever. Well, relatively, in a relative, relatively, uh, we're, we're going to see soon what this means. Uh, let's take another one, fxx equals fab, right? So this one obviously fails because I may attempt to make x equals to a, but as soon as the first x becomes a, the second x must also become a. It's the same variable, right? So then we have FAA equals FAB, which should fail. You might as well try to unify the second X with B, but then as soon as you unify the second X with B, the first X becomes B as well, because it's the same variable. So then the term, the first term is FBB equals FAB, which should fail. So this one fails. If we, however, say FXX, Right, fxx equals faa, x is a, as soon as the first x becomes a, the second x becomes a, we have faa equals faa, and succeeds. Uh, the third one is slightly more complicated, right? And uh, we see that, right, we can make the second x equal to b, as soon as the second x is B, the first x must become B, the first argument of F would be GAB, and that can be made the value of Y, and then if Y is GAB and X is B, the unification succeeds, right? And in this process, we have computed values for the variables. And this is how we get results from our computation. Okay? So, all these are answers that are returned by the interpreter, answers to our query. They don't rely on an existing program, but we'll see soon that we can load a program and pass on queries that are related to that program. All right, each individual value for each individual variable is a binding. Once a binding happens, that binding can, cannot be undone unless, well, we'll see how, right? So let's, for the time being, let's just assume that it cannot be undone. Uh, you'll see that there's a, there's a possibility of choice, uh, and, um, and uh, that choice is explored via backtracking, so as we backtrack, we actually can uh, undo a binding and redo it. But in general, that's not... That's not, that's not useful. It's not useful to think of a variable as uh, being able to take many values. A variable takes only one value. Uh, the previous, the last unification um, was, uh, it actually has a tree representation. It is much clearer what happens in the tree representation, right? So we have the two terms. And notice that when the variable x appears multiple times in a, in a term, it is actually shared the interpreter will be smart enough to share that variable. So when bindings happen, right, bindings happen only once. As soon as, so, so as we try to unify the, um, the two terms, we're going to say what? We're going to say that f is the same as f. This guy well, on the right-hand right, right side, we have a variable. So let me point the variable to whatever is here. The variable doesn't have a value yet, so let me give it a value, right? Then, then we're done, right? So we keep exploring. We go in this direction. We go depth first, and we go depth first in both trees. So as we go depth first, we reach this point, which is a variable that doesn't have a value yet. And then we create a binding for that variable. And after we have finished this process of exploration and we have seen no conflict, if we see no conflict, we decide that the unification is successful. 
And then we want to extract the answers. Let's look at the answer. The answer for x is very simple, right? x just points to b. But let's look at the answer for y. y initially was equal to gax. But later in the unification process, x took a value. So we go and just explore the value of y. y is going to be g a. And as we reach this node, we see that this node is, in fact, a variable that is bound to b. So what we write here is b. So the value of y surreptitiously changed because a variable that was initially unbound when it was part of the answer to b has become bound later in the unification process. Is this clear? Okay. Obviously, just one unification would be terribly useless, so we can have multiple unifications. And uh, they would be separated by a comma. And the comma stands for conjunction. We want the first unification to succeed and also the second one to succeed. Right? If the first one doesn't succeed, the second one is not attempted. The conjunction has an operational uh, uh, behavior, right? As soon as we know that failure occurs, we stop the process. So again, the interesting aspect is that we can unify, we can provide a partial answer for x here Right, x will be unified with f, y, y, and later fill in the blanks, sort of, by unifying the variables that appear inside the answer to x with new values. All right, so the comma is a conjunction. Remember that. Okay, this one is interesting as well. So f, x, x, a equals f, b, y x will become b, y will become a, and then this is already a, and this is already b, right? They happen to be identical terms, so the unification succeeds. But remember that as soon as a value, as a variable is bound, the binding is in effect in all occurrences of that variable. Okay, this one is even more interesting, and we're going to see it uh, in more detail in a, in a minute. But we're going to have that x1 is bound to this g, right? Then x2 has to be bound to the second argument. And as soon as this happened, this x2 is going to be g, x3, x3, and the same happens to the second x2. And then, uh, and, and then x3 appears inside here, right? So we're going to have another binding of the third argument in both terms. So this x3 is going to become GAB, GAB. So you can see easily, right, uh, the answer to x1 the answer to x1, I, uh, I think I'm a bit, oh, all right. Is it here? No. All right, so, so, so I'm going to come later to this example, but let's just, just, just jump the gun because I don't want to write uh, that much. So this is the same example later explained through the unification algorithm. So let's look at the answer here, which is the interesting part for us right now. Right? So the important thing is that we can generate exponentially large answers right, from queries. We can have a query, and the answer may be exponential in the size of the query. But that's not entirely true because this answer, which looks very long here, right? In fact, is x1 is bound to g, and both children are the same. There's another g here. Both children are the same. There's another g here, and we have a and b. So the storage of that term is, in fact, quite compact. 
Why? Because initially we were sharing variables. These two variables are the same. Sorry. Something like that, right? So, so these these um, uh, these two variables are the same, right? So then the left and right child will actually be shared; will not be different children. All right, uh, let's under let's go through the unification algorithm. And you're going to ask, why do we need a unification algorithm? Because we can just see whether they, you know, all the queries that we've seen are so obvious. Why do we need an algorithm? Well, if your term is going to be uh, one million atoms in size, it's not going to be so easy anymore, right? So we need an algorithm. And the algorithm works with a unification request that has with a with a sequence of unification requests, right? So we have several terms, and our unification sequence of unification request is sigma 1 equals pi 1, sigma 2 equals pi 2, and so on and so forth. Right, and we, we start testing. If the functor of sigma 1 is not equal to the functor of pi 1, remember the functor is what appears at the outer side. So if we have f of something equals g of something, right, they are not equal. Also, if we have arity of sigma 1 is different from arity of pi 1, right, is the case when I have f a b equals f a, right, then we stop with failure. We can decide that failure has occurred and we can stop the process right there. Now, if arity of sigma 1 is 0, and notice that if arity of sigma 1 is 0 because we haven't failed yet, this must be false. So it means that arity of pi 1 is also 0, right? And also, because functor of sigma 1, because you haven't failed yet, functor of sigma 1 must be equal to functor of pi 1, which means that sigma 1 and pi 1 must be the same atom, right? If arity of sigma 1 is 0, then sigma 1 and pi 1 must be the same atom, which means that this unification request is trivially successful. Right? Then we can just remove it. So partial success is not interesting to us. Right? Failure is interesting because we can stop. And complete success is also important to us. Right? So as, say, as soon as we see A equals A, we can just remove it and move on. Right? And our purpose is to make the unification, the sequence of unification requests smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> till we get an empty one, in which case we can see, well, there's no contradiction. There hasn't been no failure, so we can decide that we have success. If the arity is not zero, right? If it is, we uh, remove we remove this one and we just move to the last step. And the last step just iterates further. Uh, if it is not zero, it means we have arguments, and the number of arguments of sigma one must be the same as the number of arguments of sigma two of uh, pi one. Sorry, because we haven't failed, so this must be false. Okay, so they must be the same. So then, what do we do? Well, we remove sigma 1 equals pi 1 from the current unification request. So this one, we remove it, right? But we replace it, in fact, with unification request from the arguments. So this is the replacement. Whatever was there before, we copy over, right? So we just copy it here. And we iterate, we keep going. We go back to the beginning and continue. And we continue till the sequence becomes empty. If it does, then we have success. Or we continue till we get failure. We get two atoms at the uh, two terms at the beginning, at the at the beginning of the sequence that cannot be unified. All right? So this is the case when we do not have variables. In case when we have variables, it will be slightly more complicated. But let's do an example on this one. All right. So let's see an example. All right. We have two unification requests, two equations in our query. And we apply the first step. In the first step, we check that. This guy is identical to this guy, 
and the arity of this guy is identical to the arity of this guy, right? And that happens to be true, so we can't fail yet. Then, the arity of the left uh, side term is not zero. Therefore, we're going to take the first guy, put it here, take the second guy, put it here, and form a unification request. Then take from the second argument, move it here. The second argument from here, we move it here. We have a second unification request. And whatever was there on the line is copied over. And we have a new sequence. And we go from the top of the algorithm, right? So this one now, arity zero, functor equals functor, right? And the only thing we can do is just remove it. It succeeds, not interesting. We haven't failed yet, right? So we move on, this is what remains, right? This is what remains. So we're here right now, and we continue. G is the same as G, arity of G is the same as arity of G on the other side. So B is copied here, right? So the first argument of sigma one and the first argument of pi one are copied into a new unification request. Then the second argument is copied as well. And whatever is left on the, in the sequence here is just copied over. And we keep going, right? B equals B will be just removed, right? C equals C will be just removed. Then we have this one, again, identical arity is the same, so we copy, uh, sorry. Right, then remove, then remove, empty, success. Okay? So this is how unification works, at least in the case where there are no variables. In the case when we do have variables, we need to provide answers, compute answers for those variables. Is everything okay now, so far? Questions? Well, you're probably wondering how the heck this is useful, right? I don't think it's, it's difficult to understand what it is, so bear with me. If we have terms with variables, all right, we have the slight problem of providing answers. So a lot of the steps are the same, right? But uh, we have the case when sigma one might be a variable. If sigma one is a variable, we add sigma one equals pi one to the answer. So we start with a set, which we call the answer, that contains partial bindings to variables. And those bindings become more and more refined. So as soon as we detect that this is an x, x equals pi one, we add x equals pi one to our answer. An important thing that happens right now, we replace, let's say that sigma one is variable x. Every other occurrence of x everywhere else is replaced by pi one. So essentially x has taken a value, which is pi one. So from this point on, x does not exist anymore. Everywhere where x occurs should be replaced by pi one. Right? This is how variable takes value only once, and from that point on, every occurrence of that variable should be replaced by its new value. All right, and then this is success, right? We just remove it from the current sequence, and we keep going. Now, if pi one is a variable, we might have something like fab is equal x. This kind of unification request. Well, what do we do? Equality is commutative, so I turn it around, and then I have case one, right? So I do everything I did in case one, I will do in case two as well, right? So the only thing is that we reverse the equality, because we like to have answers in the form variable equals term, and not terms equals variable. Cases three and four are the same as before. 
There is no difference. Case 5, right, is also the same as before. So we take the arguments. So if we reach this point, we don't have a variable at the top level. The variables may be embedded somewhere else inside. So we have functors, and the functors have arities. So we have to check whether the functors are the same. We have to check whether the arities are the same. And from the arguments of both functors, we create new unification requests, as we did before. right? And when we reach the end, we start again from the top. So the only problem is that whenever we encounter this variable equals term, that has to become part of the answer. Okay, so let's go to the algorithm, and the algorithm will probably will uh, give you a, uh, and, and this one is resembles to a certain extent the algorithm, that, the, uh, the, the uh, query that we have seen about a few slides ago, but I think it's not exactly the same. Uh, nevertheless, yes, the previous one, now I know, the previous one, these were exchanged, right? And I have exchanged them here just to make it more interesting. To make it more interesting because otherwise I wouldn't have the case when term equals variable, right? I would only have the case where variable equals term. So uh, it's the same unification request but, you know, with a slight change so that it will emphasize a case in the unification algorithm that uh, would otherwise not occur. So these are, this is an unification request, has variables. Let's see how it proceeds. So, first term, right, we have f at the top level, it's the same, the arity is the same, so the only thing I, I, I can do is create new unification requests from the arguments, right, so first argument from the left and first argument on the right go here, then uh, second argument from the left and second argument from the right go here, and third argument from the left, and third argument from the right go here. Okay, and we kept going. So now, what we have as the first unification request is variable equals term. So what we do is we take this guy, we take this guy and put it inside the answer. So you see, this is the partial answer that is getting more and more refined as the algorithm progresses. And then every occurrence of x1 should be replaced by its new value. Unfortunately, there's no values of, there's no occurrences of x1, so there's nothing to replace. But if inside this unification request, I would have occurrences of x1, I would have to replace those occurrences by the new value gx2x2, x2. okay? So we move on. The next one, right, which is this one, right, the next unification request is of the form term equals variable. So what we do is we reverse it. We make it x2 equals gx3x3, x3, and we add this, this here. And now we replace x2 everywhere in everywhere else, right? So notice that x2 appeared here in the answer and it has been replaced by the new value of x2, which is gx3x3, okay? And we keep going. So finally, we have an unification request of the form x3 equals gab and we take this and add it to the answer, right? So every value of x3 Every occurrence of x2 will be replaced by the new value GAB. So you notice that it's been replaced here, 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 and then it is added here as well, right? So we, we essentially add it and also replace x3 everywhere else. So we add it here and replace it everywhere. Is this clear? Okay, so keep all that in mind. So all these things that we're adding to the answers are bindings. Remember the term. Okay. And we move on to slightly more complicated uh, stuff. Remember everything you learned about unification requests. 
The simplest type of prologue program is one containing facts. All right? Prologue, I haven't told you what it stands for, so let me tell you what it stands for. It stands for programming in logic. So every line of prologue program has a logical reading. Uh, all right, so facts are <coughs> facts, right? So correspond to real life facts, which are things, concepts that are true, are known to be true, right? Um, so we can define a little database of facts that we use, use to, we, we, we want to model. For instance, family relations. Uh, we can say that uh, the parent of John is George, the parent of John is Mary, the parent of George is Adam, and so on, the parent of George is Beth kind of Adam is James. So these are things that in the world of this particular program are true, right? Are um, uh, true without questioning, right? And uh, they are sort of like a database. What do we do with this program? So we put this program into a file and we go to the product prompt and say consult the name of the file. This program is loaded and now we can ask queries against the program. We can ask, is the parent of George Adam? And the, the interpreter will reply, true, right? Because um, we have such a fact here, okay? We can also find answers to our queries, right? We don't need to only query things that are already true or already false. We can try to find answers. For instance, we can say, who is the parent of John? And this is how we encode that, the parent of John and X, X being a variable, and the system will say, let me try to find values for X so that the query is true. And the first answer is George, Right? The first answer is George. And there may be more answers. So the user is invited to type a, a, a key to express whether more answers should be, um, um, should be found or not. Right? If you type a period or if you type enter, uh, you would not get any more answers. The search stops there. But if you type semicolon, you would get more answers, right? And the next answer is Mary. Mary is also a possible answer. So you see, Prolog will perform this exploration process and will try to find all the possible answers, um, right, if uh, that is what is uh, what it is asked for. Notice also that um, it's up to us to model the world correctly, right? We, uh, it, it so happens that every person here has at most two parents. And it also happens that if it has two parents are of different genders, at least you know by the name. But we could have written this database of facts as we please. We're, not, we're not under no restriction to provide only two parents or to provide parents with names of different genders at all, right? So the modeling of the world is up to the program. In fact, you know, in today's world, uh, uh, a child can have up to five parents. You know that, right? So there's, uh, there are biological parents, right? The uh, embryo can be taken out, implanted into a surrogate mother, which gives birth, and then the child can be adopted. So it's three mothers, two, pa two fathers, right? Um, yeah, so, uh, all right, so, 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 um, um, this is the, uh, the, the simplest type of follow program, and um, by declaring these facts, we have, in fact, defined a predicate, right, which is parent, and the predicate, with the meaning is the one that you know from logic. It's essentially a relationship between objects, right? That relationship is true between 
the stated uh, objects in the program. And if I invent any other name, if I put uh, in a, a name that uh, does not appear in the program, if I say parent of, uh, we don't have a Harry, right? So Harry and X or whatever I put here, since Harry does not appear in uh, the, the program, uh, the answer will obviously be false. Okay? Now, no variables means ground. So whatever doesn't have variables is called ground. Ground terms, ground predicates. No variables, right? And uh, facts are ground. Uh, the dot .pl is a typical extension of a prolog program. Those are queries. The question mark minus or dash is the prompt that is typed by the, printed by the system. The consult and parent are queries which are typed by the user. The, um, the interpreter will reply with answers, right? If there's no variables, the answer is simply true. If there are variables, and the query doesn't fail, answers for those variables will be printed out. And the semicolon is again typed for the user to request for further solutions if there are, if, if, if uh, any would be found would be printed out, right? But you can stop the search by just printing some, just typing something out. All right, so we can go as far as, the most general query we can, we can um, uh, execute against the program that we have seen is this one, parent x, y. What are the values of x and y that, uh, such that x is the, uh, the parent of x is y, right? And we would get a lot more answers, right? Every answer, after every answer, the interpreter stops. We have to type semicolon, and then we get another answer. So the interesting aspect here is that after the first, the, the last answer is printed, the interpreter still doesn't know that there are no more solutions. It says, well, there's a search space out there that I haven't explored fully. So do you want me to explore that or not, right? You type semicolon to say, yes, I want you to explore. And the search of that remaining search space doesn't produce any solutions. So somewhat strangely, you will end up with the, sorry, you will end up with an answer of false here. All right? So you get solution one, solution two, solution three, solution four, false. Right? This is because Prolog sees all these, uh, uh, all these facts as a search space. And the only thing that it knows is whether it has fully explored it or not. Whenever a solution is found, the, the interpreter will know whether the search is complete or not. And when it presents the opportunity for you to type semicolon, it's simply saying, I haven't fully explored the space, right? Which is why it is possible to uh, obtain this false. This false is in general annoying, and uh, we would like to get rid of it. And there are ways of doing that. And we're going to explain this in a minute. All right, is this clear? Has anyone done the database module or know about databases? One, two. Right, so does it remind you of SQL? Right, SQL table, SQL query, query exactly the same effect. All right, so Prolog is in fact stronger. SQL is, in terms of power, is a subset of Prolog. All right, let's move on uh, further with our, uh, our programs. So we add a new concept, that of rules, Prolog rules. So we're going to say that ancestor of x is y if the parent of x is y. That's option one. Option two is the ancestor of x is y if the parent of x is some z, and the ancestor of z is y, right? So notice the logical reading that we are having. The 
the colon dash operator that you're seeing there has the meaning of reverse implication, and it is read as if. Right implication is usually an arrow in logic, right? So you're saying that P implies Q, but here we want to express the fact that Q is implied by P, right? So this has the meaning of reverse implication. And we're saying Q if P, right? Answer store of X is Y if the parent of X is some Z and the answer store of Z is Y. So we have two um, rules or we also call them clauses, the comma stands for conjunction. So on the right-hand side, we want both predicates to be true. We want the parent of x to be some z, and also the ancestor of z to be y. Okay? The two rules that we have here represent alternatives. So either the first rule holds or the second rule holds in my quest for finding, or in the interpreter's quest for, for, for finding an answer to the query. So let's explore queries that use rules. Okay, so this is the logical reading that I was just um, telling you about. Oh, terminology. So left-hand side of the rule is called the head, and right-hand side of the rule is called the body. And uh, we use the period as a delimiter. We have seen that previously as well. All the facts were terminated by a period. All right, let's see periods. So now we can ask ancestor of John and X, which stands for give me all the ancestor of, ancestors of John. And we have the same behavior. X is, one answer is George, one answer is Mary, another answer is Adam, another answer is Beth, another answer is James. And then after James, you type semicolon, the interpreter senses that they're still part of the search space that is unexplored and will uh, explore it and then not find anything and say false. Um, we can have multiple atoms in our... Uh, oh, by the way, this is an atom. Right, so if I have a term but I use it as a query, right, that element of the uh, query is called an atom. So we can have multiple atoms in our query, right? And all of them should succeed for the entire query to succeed. Remember, the comma represents conjunction. Um, all right, so this query, a bit, a bit, a bit silly, right? But uh, x and y should be equal from here. So you see that x and y, both of them have the same value. And we can, uh, we can check whether John and Adam, right, are um, one is the grandfather of the other, and who's the who's the father that is in the middle, right? So we can have this kind of query. We find the answer George, and uh, that's the only answer. And uh, the most complex query that we can have is ancestor X Y, right? We get all these combinations, right? All the possible combinations of um, people that are related. I think the longest relationship is grand, great-grandfather to great-grandchild, right? And every pair of people, I think, or maybe not every pair of people, but a lot uh, of people will be related in this way. Now, how, what's the process of finding this answer? So it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of obvious, right, what's happening. We're asking ancestor, right, and then the system will try to use these rules, right? Let me, you're answer, uh, asking me ancestor x, y. Let me first check if I can find parent of x, y, right? And I have explored the search space of this rule first, and then I found an answer, but I haven't tried the second rule. So let me go and also try the second rule for you, right? You press semicolon. And the interpreter says, let me also consider the second rule as a potential source of answers, right? So there will be a backtracking process there of trying the rules because we may get multiple answers from multiple rules. So the process that obtains these answers is called resolution, all right? And there's an algorithm for it, and we're going to learn this algorithm. 
In this algorithm, one important concept is variable renaming. Um, so whenever we use a clause, we, we use an, a clause for execution, the variables in that clause are renamed with completely new names, names that haven't been seen, seen before. Um, in this way, variables are local to a clause. So going back here where we have seen these rules, right? This x and this x have nothing in common. And if I rename this x to x1 everywhere in the clause, I have not changed the meaning of the clause. Variables are local to the clause or rule, right? Rules or clauses. Right, so we, you see examples of renaming there. First renaming, x becomes x1, y becomes y1, z becomes z1. Second renaming, x becomes x2, right? And every time the variables are completely new, completely fresh. And uh, the algorithm is also very simple, all right? The, uh, the trouble is going to be how do we find it useful? Why is it useful? But let's go through how it works first, right? And I would like you to pay attention to this because this goes to define an execution model for a programming language, right? Something that you have an intuition about, so you've uh, worked with um, uh, imperative programs in general, and you have an execution model. You haven't been explicitly thought about that execution model, but you have an intuition about it. You know that this instruction executes, and then that instruction, and then that instruction, and then each instruction performs a certain change in the environment, changes the value of a variable if it's an assignment, for instance, and so on and so forth, right? So this is a completely different execution model. It performs computation in a totally different way, and it is useful. It will be shown to be useful uh, very soon, right? And you can see a completely different approach to computation in this way. So what do we have? We have a query. The query typically has some atoms, A1 to AN, a sequence of atoms. So what do we do? We pick a rule from the program and rename its variables. And when we say pick, right, well, how do you pick? Well, you pick in a way, in, su in such a way that later you can undo this pick and pick something else. Right, so when we say pick, this sounds like non-deterministic choice, and it sounds like let's pick something, but remember what we picked, so later we can come back and pick something else and try that too. All right, so we pick something from the program, some rule from the program. We rename its variables, and we assume that this is the rule after the variables have already been renamed. And the rule may actually be a fact. The fact is a special case of a rule where b1 up to bk are completely missing. Okay? And then what do we do? Right, so we have the rule, we have the query. Out of the head of the query and the first atom in the rule, we create a unification request. Then we copy these guys here. And then we copy this guy here. And we keep doing that till the query becomes empty. And that's all. So it's very, very simple. How comes that it's useful? Right? But it is a computational mechanism. It is an execution model. It is a semantics, if you will, but we haven't talked about formally about semantics. We're going to see semantics a bit later. But it, when we do that, and then you come back here, you will recognize that this is a very valid definition for semantics. Let's see an example. And so remember, pick means backtracking. Means I pick this rule first, but I'm going to come back later and uh, and um, 
pick something else. So uh, I have prepared a meta interpreter, um, which of course you may use for uh, on your own, but uh, it's uh, maybe a bit too advanced for you to understand how it works. So I don't recommend that much you um, looking at the program. Um, so, and, and you will also see how the interpreter works. The program is already loaded. You see it's a bit of, it's, um, it, it resembles an IDE. And um, we're going to execute this program. I removed some of the, of the clauses. I can't remember exactly whether, how similar is this to uh, the program on the slide. But this is our program. Uh, I'm going to remove this because we haven't learned about it yet. Save it, compile it. And first of all, let's let's run ancestor of Jim and X and see what happens. So somewhere here, I should have ancestor of Jim and X, and we can see four solutions. So I'm going to try to keep this on the side so it's still visible. Right. So the ancestor is the same. It's just that the parents are different. Okay. So Jim, obviously Harry is a solution, and then Jim, Anna is a second solution, right? But then Anna is uh, a parent of George, and Anna is also a parent of Mary, so George and Mary are also ancestors of Jim, okay? Uh, let's see how this works. So this meta predicate... will visualize the execution. All right, so you see the same behavior, but you see a bit more information of how the execution goes. All right, this is the original query. And Prolog likes renaming, so this is the renamed query. X has become G385. All right, now uh, we ignore this part for the time being. We're going to talk about it soon. So we pick a clause. The C is always the clause that has been picked, right? And if we go here, we see that a clause that has been picked, you can still see it right here, is the first clause in the program. Sorry, the first clause in the program, this one. Right, ancestor XY, parent XY. But X and Y have been renamed. So X has become G48. Y has become G484, right? And then this is the current query or goal, and this is the current clause that we have chosen. And what we do is we put this here, and we put this here, right? So we create the unification request, and then we copy this stuff here. And then if I had anything here, I would have copied it to the end right here. Unfortunately, it does nothing, right? But it's exactly what I have described on the slide. Is this clear? And I have a new query. So this, this U points to a new query, right? And then this new query, the unification request that we have here succeeds. It's easy to see that it succeeds. Right? G484 should be Jim, and G483 should be, sorry, G483 should be Jim, and G484 should be equal to G385, which remember is in fact X. Okay? So there's a new goal. And we pick a clause for this goal. And we're going to pick the first clause here. Obviously, when we pick a clause, we're going to pick one that has a chance to succeed. So in the first case, because my query started with ancestor, I would pick a clause whose head starts with ancestor. Nothing else would have a chance to succeed. And here we do the same. Since my current query has at the top level parent, I'm going to pick a clause that at the top level has parent. This is a fact, so the body is empty. This true means empty. And we create the same unification request, right? So this guy goes here, 
no, I'm, I'm always, I think I wrote them in the, the wrong order. So this guy goes here, and this guy goes here. Okay, we have unification request, succeeds, the query has become empty, and we have an answer, right? We have an answer because this G385 is equal to Harry. This G385, in fact, is X, so X is Harry, and we have our first answer. Is this clear? Now, a very interesting thing happens. Found first answer, you see that the interpreter is waiting for us to press semicolon. What happens when we press semicolon? I'm, I just press semicolon, right? Well, it says, yes, we have attempted, we have attempted this fact. Remember the pick file part? We picked that. Let us backtrack. Let us go back and undo everything up to the point where we picked the first fact. And instead of picking the first fact, let us pick the second fact. Right? So this second fact here is picked here. So we have the same goal. We do not pick this anymore. We instead pick pick this, sorry. We instead pick this. And I enjoy it, right? So a new unification request is created, which is here, right? This one. And you can see that this one fails. When we get failure, backtracking is triggered automatically. We don't get a report of failure. We only get a report of failure if there's failure, and the exploration has been completed. The entire search space has been completely explored. Otherwise, we don't get a report of failure. So failure happens. Backtracking is triggered automatically. So the interpreter says, well, this clause didn't work. Let me go to the uh, undo everything, the point where that clause was picked, and then try the next one. Let me try this one. So this one is tried here, right? Unification request is created, but Anna and Jim cannot be the same. So it fails as well. Fails, backtracking is triggered automatically. So it goes back and says, let me go back to the point where the last clause was picked, right? Undo up to that point and then pick the next thing. Uh, these are comments, right? Star uh, lines starting with percent are comments. So let me pick this one. This one is picked now. You can see it here. The unification request is created here and succeeds. So we get a new solution. Is this clear? OK. So the next solutions that we're going to get are, are going to backtrack further. So I'm going to press semicolon. And I'm going to get a new solution. So this one, there was a lot of failure. What happens? So let's go back to the point where the previous solution was found, right, which was here. So you see, they will say, let me backtrack to the last point of choice. Well, this was the last point of choice. There are no more parent clauses to select. So we have to backtrack a further level, one, one level further, right? So then what was the even previous? What was the previous point of choice? Well, it was the point, the, the, the point where we have chosen this clause, right? So let's undo everything up to the point where that clause was chosen, that rule was chosen, and let us replace it by this rule, the second rule. So you see this rule being selected here, being picked here, right? What happens now is the goal was ancestor of Jim and 385. Do you remember this goal? It was the only, the only atom in the sequence. So what we do is the head goes here, 
the first atom in the goal goes here, and it was the only atom, just, you know. Uh, and, and then these two guys, right, these two guys, parent and ancestor, you can see them here, parent and ancestor. So they're just copied over. Okay? And the algorithm goes further. It's, it just keeps, keeps going, right? So now unification succeeds, right? This is the new query. All right, I have to select a new clause. So we select a new clause, one that has parent on, on, on in, the, in the head, of course, right? And we create a new unification request. And the unification request succeeds. So um, we have uh, a new goal. And in this goal, right, in this goal, we have to pick a new clause. Which one do you think we, we pick? The first one, right? Obviously, the one that you see here, right? So every new pick starts from the top, right? We have two levels of picking ancestor now. We have two levels of picking ancestor. There's one level, the lower level, where the second rule was picked, right? So there's a lower level where this guy was picked. Then we moved on two more levels, and at the third level, let's say that this is the first level, right? Or it's the, the base level. And at the uh, at a, a later level, we have a new, a new picking, a new round of picking for the ancestor clause, and we're going to start from the top again, right? So the picks of, the, the, of, the, of a rule are independent of each other. The, um, the search space is really the Cartesian product. Of, uh, or of choices, okay? And everything keeps going exactly in the same manner, all right? And there's, there's going to be a lot of failure that is not reported. And then, finally, we find the solution, which is George. And we can press semicolon again. Backtracking happens. This time, very little backtracking happens, right? Why is that? Because... These two, these two clauses, these two facts are one next to each other, right? So when after the first one succeeds, the second one will succeed right away. And then we press semicolon again, and this will emphasize the fact that we explore a search space, which is completely valid, right? The interpreter has no way of knowing whether in that, that search space there will be a solution or not. So it's a valid it's a valid um, uh, exploration. It, it's, you can't know in advance, right? So you will only know whether there's an answer there or not by exploring. And you see only failures. And then, because in this part, we have completely explored. We, get, we have completed the exploration and no solution was found. We get the answer false. All right? At any point, let me do this again. I can press Enter and stop the search. Or I can I may want only two answers, right? I get a second one, I press enter, I stop the search, right? So that means that the interpreter is aware of the fact that there is more search to be done, but not the user doesn't want it, so the search stops there. Is this clear? Any questions? Okay, we're going to see benefits of this shortly. Okay, shall we move on? So back to the slides. So what have we learned? The current state of computation is a query, a partial answer, and a stack of choice points, right? At, um, and, and you actually have seen the stack, but the stack was not that important at this point, right? But essentially, all the, all, all the places where choices were made are remembered, right? Placed in a stack in reverse order. Whenever backtracking needs to occur, we just pick the most recent level from the stack of choice points, 
and we operate the next choice, right? We undo everything up to the point of having made the, the, that current that that choice, and we take the next rule uh, and and continue the execution, right? When does backtracking happen? In two situations, right? One is when user requested a success was found, the solution was found, user requested by pressing semicolon, or when failure occurs, and at that point, backtracking occurs silently uh, without, without being reported, right? The only failure that is reported is the one after completing the entire search space, the entire exploration of the search space. Um, all right, and that's going to be useful somehow. Now, how do we get rid of that annoying false? We want to do that once in a while. So the mechanism is called the cut and alters the search, all right? Alters the search by fiddling with the stack of choice points. And it will operate by removing some of the choices, choice points that appears on the stack. And uh, I'm going to do another demo for that. A very short one. So I'm going to put a cut here, which is an exclamation mark. So save, compile, and then get the prolog prompt. All right, so let's run again the direct query and see what changes. So you see now that we only have two solutions. We don't have four solutions anymore. And uh, I, I can be even more aggressive. I can put a cut here. And you see only one solution and no false anymore, right? So this is how we're going to get rid of the false. But let's try to execute this one, right, and see the two solutions and see how the cut uh, changes the execution. Oh, you're, you might be wondering what the zero is. The zero is the indentation level. The predicate is recursive. And as we move further into the recursion, you see that everything is indented a bit further to show the hierarchy of choices, right? Uh, and the initial value of the, of the hierarchy should be zero. So um, so we, we, uh, we start execution. And always when we have a cut, the first execution is the same, up to the first solution. The first execution will just be the same, all right? So you see, why is that? Because first of all, uh, our clause is the clause that doesn't have a cut, right? So the first clause that we choose doesn't have a cut. But also, oops, the solution uh, uh, usually will be the same. All right, so let's move further. This, the second solution is also the same because as far as the ancestor rule is concerned, we're still using the first rule. And now we're going to see the cut being coming into effect. All right, so you see here that the second clause is being chosen. Now the second clause has a cut. Uh, one aspect that we haven't emphasized the last time is the level of the computation. So every time we perform a new round of choice of, of picking a clause, we increase the level. So this is the level, and we put that level in the stack of choice points. All right? And uh, if you followed in the previous uh, execution the stack of choice points, even though I told you not to, you saw that the numbers here are always in order, one, two, three, four, five, or consecutive, right? Uh, because no, nobody is fiddling with those, right? So whenever backtracking occurs, we simply go to the previous level, we make the next choice, and we try again. If we go to the previous level and there are no more choice, we go even one level, uh, backtrack one level further and continue. Now, when we take this rule and the variables are renamed, if there is a cut, we annotate the cut with the current level. 
So the clause that is picked, not just that the variables are um, renamed, but the cut is annotated with the current level. And that's an important thing. All right? So you see these cuts that are uh, annotated. And the, uh, the, the query keeps executing. Right, and it keeps executing in the first way, uh, uh, in the first, uh, uh, in the same way, until we get to execute a cut. Right, so this is where we get to execute a cut. The cut is the first atom of the query. Now, what happens when the cut is executed is that we remove from the stack of choice points all the choice points of levels higher or equal. To the one with which the cut is annotated. So you see a one here, you see a one here, levels uh, lower or equal, uh, higher or equal to, to, to one are removed. So here the, the stack of choice points contain two one, here it has become empty, right? Two is greater than one, one is equal to one, all of them are removed. And this is all the cut does. But now, because 2 and 1 are no longer there, we cannot go to level 2 and make a different, pick a different clause at level 2. We can't, cannot go back to level 1 and pick a different clause at level 1, right? So certain parts of the search space have been removed. So that's all that happens. It's a very simple mechanism. The problem is, how is this useful, right? It's always the question. And then execution proceeds as before. So we go to level four, and we, we're going to get four in the stack of choice points. We go further to level five, right? We put five there, so we have five, four, right? We keep executing, we got only failures, right? We go back and backtrack to level four and get only failures. And see, after we have explored levels 5 and 4, stack is empty. There's nowhere to backtrack. So we finish the, the, we finish the computation. Previously, without the presence of the cut, we would, still had, we would have still had levels 1 and 2 in there. So we would have gone back, made a different choice for level 2. Then we would have gone back even further and made a different choice for level 1. And we would have found the solutions George and Mary, right? These are solutions that are no longer found. All right? So this is all what the, what the cut does. Now we're going to look at examples and we're going to understand uses of cut. Uh, and we're, we're going to understand how this is useful. Is this mechanism clear so far? Just how it works? I, I know that you're wondering how, how in the world this can be useful. Right? It will take a bit more practice to understand that. But is this clear? Yes? So later I'm going to come back to this and refer to it as a semantics. Well, it's more of an execution mode. But it's much simpler than the one for imperative programs. All right? Okay, let's talk about practical features of Prolog. So, uh, so far we have discussed pure Prolog. The interesting aspect of pure Prolog is that the comma which represents conjunction is commutative. No matter how you write atoms around the comma, in which order, the answer is always the same. But this is actually not very useful, right? We want, for reasons of efficiency, to set a certain order. And you have seen that always in a query, we, eval we evaluate, we consider atoms from left to right, all right? And we want to capture the dynamic of variables taking up values, uh, all right? So we have a few uh, uh, types of queries, types of uh, predicates that Whose, uh, whose behavior will be dependent of where we put it in the clause. Um, right? One is atom. It tests whether, uh, at the time of the evaluation, x is bound to an atom. Right? So uh, um, let me show you a few examples of this. 
right? If I say atom uh, A, this is an atom, right? If I say atom of a variable, this is not an atom. But if I say X is bound to A, right? This is true. X already has been bound to an atom. But if I say atom X, X is bound to A, this will fail. You see, so what I was telling you about not being, the order not being important is no longer true. Because at this point, since we are considering uh, atoms from left to right, X has not been bound yet. It's going to be bound at some point in the future, but it hasn't been bound yet. So the query will fail. Uh, we're going to be using all these, um, all these uh, predicates. Uh, var does the same for a variable, right? So succeeds if X is unbound. Right? So it may be unbound now, and var succeeds, and x may become bound later, and that's fine. Integer x succeeds if x is bound to an integer. It's very similar to atom, just that x should be an integer. Now, term equal dot dot list. This is called the univ operator. It decomposes a term into its components, so probably the best thing to do is still show a little demo. Right? So if I say uh, x equal dot dot, sorry, f a b equal dot dot l, you see l, l is a list, and we're going to talk about lists shortly, um, and uh, it's decomposed, right? And uh, the, the de decomposition is all, all only at one, at one level. If I say G and X, Y here, you see that the second element of the list is the entire first argument of the term. The decomposition is not recursive. Uh, this will help us identify, when this is an operator like addition plus, will help us identify the operation that is being performed in, in, in an expression. So it's going to be a very useful um, a very useful uh, um, a tool, right? Uh, right X outputs the binding effects, outputs the current binding effects. So again, it's, uh, it's impure, right, in the sense that X might be now unbound and later becomes bound, and if I write an unbound variable, I'm going to get only its renaming. So this is probably also useful to... Uh, show. So I can say write x, and x is unbound now, right? Uh, I'm only going to go to, to get its renaming. So this is not useful at all. If I have x equals a, some atom, and say write x, I'm going to get a, of course. Um, right? And it, it produces output. And it succeeds, always succeeds. So it's a side effect predicate. It affects the environment and always succeeds. All right, uh, one very important concept, prolog operators, will help us define an imperative language inside prolog and write an interpreter for it. All right? So, um, if we write A plus B, this is a legal writing in, in prolog. Because plus is defined as an infix operator, so it can have terms on the left and on the right. But this is just an alternative writing for a term. Okay? And the standard prefix writing is still, this one, is still valid. Because typically we write terms as F, A, B. And if I want to replace F by plus, that's fine. Plus AB is a legal term. Remember, plus is a, is a legal atom. All right? Now, Prolog internally says, ah, well, I have a definition for this guy being an operator. So I'm going to accept A plus B as an alternative writing for this. So if we try this unification, this, in fact, succeeds. Now, you're very used for, with plus being standing for addition. This is not a case in prologue. Plus means nothing. 
plus does not mean addition. We can give it the meaning of addition if we want to, but in general, plus is just a functor, and this is just a piece of data. And it's the alternative writing for this. It's just another way, way to write plus AB. But this plus, having been defined as an operator, right? Uh, notice here that I, 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 um, I, I bind X to plus AB, and the interpreter replies with X equals A plus B. So since plus is an operator in Prolog, Prolog says, well, I'm going to give you what I think looks nicer. It's not that it's different from plus AB. It just Prolog thinks that this writing is nicer than this writing, so it prefers this one. Okay? Plus, having been defined as an operator with an associativity, if I'm going to write x plus b equals, equal, equals a plus b plus, x plus y equals a plus b plus c, right? We're going to get x equals a plus b and y equals c. Right? Why? Well, a plus b plus c is this term. x plus y is this term. When we perform unification, y should be, x should be this guy, y should be this guy, right? If we do x plus y equals a plus b star c, inside prolog star has higher precedence than plus. So x is going to be a, y is going to be b star c. But star doesn't mean multiplication. It's just a syntactic construct, right? And we can have arbitrarily large expressions with variables inside and unification would work. And this will allow us to extract components from our toy imperative language and process them, right? It will allow us to process program components. Now, we can define our own operators. So, well, I would like to have A as an operator. If we try this without declaring A as an operator, this will result in error. But as soon as we perform an operator declarations, declaration, which is the one here, and we're going to find out soon what everything means in there, x equals 1A3 succeeds, right? This is just an alternative for this. Or, or again, uh, sorry, uh, for, not this one. This, this one, BAC is just an alternative for ABC. Just an alternative for writing a piece of data. Right? And it doesn't matter that A is an operator. A is just an atom. So if I want to write this, it's just an alternative for this. They both become legal. And it works with plus two. This and this are the same. Notice the spaces. Is just a different way of writing a term. Okay? I have declared the operator here with left associativity. We're going to see the meaning of this soon, but I'm just telling you that it's left associativity. So if I'm saying x, a, y is bound, right, is unified to 1, a, 2, a, 3, then because of the left associativity, x is going to be bound to 1, a, 2, and y is going to be bound to 3. But we can alter the associativity by providing our own brackets. So if we say x as a, y is 1, a bracket to a, 3, close bracket, then x is going to be 1, and y is going to be 2, a, 3. Okay? And it goes with terms as large as you would like. The way A has been declared here in this operator declaration, A has higher precedence than plus. Just happens. This is my declaration, right? So if I say x plus y a z equals 1 plus 2 a 3, right? Higher precedence means that this is performed first. It has higher precedence. So 1 is going to be bound to x. Uh, x is going to be bound to 1 and y to 2 and z to 3. 
right? Remember, this, this is just another way of saying, of expressing this. Okay? It's a syntactic trick. But this syntactic trick is going to prove very useful. Let me add two new operators, which I call while and do. And we're going to, again, find out later what these, what these details mean, right? So as soon as we do that, this becomes a legal term in Prolog. That looks kind of like a procedural language, right? But it's a piece of data in Prolog. So I can take this term, which is a piece of data, and make my own interpretation that this is a toy program and execute it. So I'm going to be able to write an interpreter for it. All right? So operator declarators are, declarations are very useful. We can extract program components. So if I unify this term with this term here, I'm going to get that B is the test of the while loop and S is the body of the while. Right? So I can extract from a while loop, I can extract its condition and its body. And remember this is just another way of writing this. It's a syntactic trick. It's a means by which Prolog builds the abstract syntax tree of a user-defined language. Is this clear? We're going to do examples. So obviously, it's, it pays to look at the tree representation, and you will only notice that this tree representation is the abstract syntax tree of a toy program. Okay? Now, how do we do these op declarations? We have, so obviously, we have to say which operator we want to declare, right? So this is where we put the operator, if you remember. Right? And we have two things that were sort of esoteric, right? The precedence and the associativity. The precedence is a number between 1 and 1,200. I have no idea where, where 1,200 uh, is chosen as the limit. It's been there since 72 when the first uh, Prolog interpreter was, um, was um, uh, put on the market. Um, all right, so lower value binds more tightly. So star will have a lower value there than plus. And then there's an associativity. And the associativity has a strange way of being specified, right? Uh, so for instance, y has an associativity declared as yfx. And this means left associativity. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell you how we, how we uh, declare that. Let's say we have the numbers, the expression 1 plus 2 plus 3. So in general, we could we could create um, two different trees for this expression. One would be plus one plus two three, and plus plus one two three. Now the Y says F stands for the operator, so F stands for plus. The Y says that the the Whatever appears on the left, if an operator appears on the left, it should be of precedence lower or equal. And X stands for precedence that is strictly lower. Right? So that's the distinction. Y is lower or equal, whereas X is strictly lower. Now, if I look at this expression, right? So I don't have an operator here. This is fine. And I have an operator here of the same precedence, right? It's the same operator, so it's with the same precedence. The x here does not allow equal precedence. Therefore, this tree is illegal. Whereas for this tree, right, to the right I don't have an operator, so I don't care. On the left I have an operator of equal precedence, 
but the specification here allows me to have an operator of equal precedence. Therefore, this tree is legal. So this specification right, sort of works in the way of let me build all the possible trees, syntactic trees that I get, and let me reject the ones that are illegal, and hopefully I'm left with only one that is legal, and then that one that is legal is the standard interpretation. If there are more, uh, many possible interpretations, then the prolog interpreter will complain. So this is how it works, right? Y means precedence lower or equal. X means precedence that is strictly low. So when we have X, F, Y, you, you see clearly that this leads to uh, left associativity here. If I have 1 plus 2 plus 3, I'll always go and perform the left operation first and then the right operation. Y, F, X, uh, X, F, Y will be right associativity, right? Symmetrically. And do you know an operator that is typically right associative? Louder. Exponential, very good, right? So if I say 2 to the power of 3 to the power of 4, this thing is supposed to be a carrot, right? So typically we do it this way. And Prolog does have an exponentiation operator, and it will be declared like this. XFX means no associativity, meaning that this kind of expression, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 operator, 2 operator, 3, will be illegal. I can't associate to the left. I can't associate to the right either. Whatever tree I would try to build, right, it will have an operator of equal precedence on either the right or left, and that's illegal. Why if y is ambiguous and will not be allowed? That's why you don't see it there. Then we have unary operators. So we have unary prefix and unary postfix. Prefix, same rule. This stands for the operator, and the x stands for what the operator is applied to, and in the tree of that, we must have an operator at the top that is of precedence that is strictly higher, strictly tighter, right? Whereas Y would allow us tighter or equal. Minus, the unary minus is declared as uh, FY. So because of this, we can have minus, minus 3, Let's say, let's say, but notice the space between the two minuses. XF would be unary postfix with the same rules. There is no currently no uh, postfix operator declared, but we're going to declare the semicolon as a terminator, as an instruction terminator, as a postfix operator. Okay. So these are the declarations. You won't. Uh, well, we'll fiddle with them. So you you, you can declare on operators and uh, play with them and and see how they work. There's quite a bunch of predefined operators in Prolog. Uh, if you just type help op, you'll get the list of them. All right. And you can see which of them we can already use. Uh, the arithmetic operators are declared and are declared with the, with the uh, expected levels. Right. But remember, a priori, there's no meaning attached to these operators. So we can get quite a few op declarations and get a programming language going, right? So as soon as we have these operator declarations in Prolog, we can write a term like this, right? So you may see this as a program, but it's a piece of data. And we can subject this piece of data to some processing, compile it into something, interpret it, execute it, whatever we want to do. Right? So you'll see that writing an interpreter in Prolog for this language that looks like a procedural language is a piece of cake. It's like 20 lines. Right, easy to see, easy to understand, easy as an example of semantics for a programming language. So this is going to be the object of one of our lessons. Okay, program manipulation. Let's take a very small example. Let's say we have if statements in our program that, and many of these if statements have the negated condition. And we would like to make the program more efficient by Right? Removing the negation 
and then changing the two arms of the if. Right? S1 goes in the else branch, and S2 goes in the then branch. Right? Whatever is there, this can be 100 lines of program, this can be 1,000 lines of program, right? But actually, S1 and S2 should be recursively transformed as well. We shouldn't be just copying them. So these are the rules. So I transform. This is my source. This is my source right here. And this is 100 lines of program, and this is 1,000 lines of program. And my output should be this program. If instead of not B, I have B, right, then and the transformation of S2, the transformation of S1, where recursively we transform S1 into S1T and S2 into ST, S2T. And then, and then we use the cut here. Why do we use the cut? Well, the second rule says transform SS. You see this S, how do I tell the interpreter that this S should not be an if? I want the transformation to return identity for everything that is not an if of this form, right? So, so the cut says that. We're saying, well, if you have managed to pass the unification request and you have managed to use the first clause, by executing the cut, you have removed the second clause from the choice point. Therefore, the second rule will never be used if there is success from the first rule. All right? However, if the unification request with the first rule does not succeed, it means that the cut does not get a chance to get executed, so then we're going to resort to the second rule to proceed further. All right? So this is when the cut becomes very useful. All right. Otherwise, if I don't want to use the cut here, I should say, in here, I should say, right, colon dash, S is not equal if blah, blah, blah. Just, just a minute. OK? So, so the cut helps me save some effort, as well as some code. OK, uh, let's continue with this next, next time. And I'm going to have a little, or maybe I'm just going to uh, finish the lecture in a, in a video. It's three more slides. Um, but uh, there's a little demo there. So maybe it's going to be 10, 15 minutes of lecture. Um, I'm going to put it in a video and upload it. And then you can watch it on your own. Um, next time, next, uh, so the tutorial will be completely on Prolog uh, next week. And there's a new problem set out, which is also completely on Prolog. So thanks for coming. See you next time.